Um, we have an incredible pleasure now of welcoming um, Lex to come and preach to us this morning. Lex is, to use a Christian term, a father in this house. Um, he is someone that as an eldership team we have leaned on and we learn from, um, yeah, and his wife Jo as well. So they, they lead um, Jubilee and Kloof Street. They have older children, but they've taken on fostering newborn babies. So this is not a grandchild. This is a, <laughs> this is a foster child that's with them now. Um, an incredible blessing to have people who run a full ch a church themselves, but to come and spend time ministering to us. Um, so would you like to come up, Lex, and may I pray for you? Father, thank you for Lex, thank you for Joe, thank you for their obedience, thank you for their willingness to serve us when they are serving so much already themselves. And we just pray, Father, now that as Lex carries us on in, in our Ephesians series, that you'll speak powerfully through him, Lord. We don't want to, we, as we said earlier, we don't want this to be an ordinary Sunday. This is a Sunday where we meet with the King of Heaven's armies where you're fighting battles on our behalf, Lord. And I just pray, Father, that we will now open our hearts and our ears to hear what you have to say to each one of us. There is food for our soul here, Lord, now, and we are all hungry. So, Father, feed us, Lord. Feed us your truth. Feed us your word through legs so that we can come away from this filled with food that satisfies, Lord. Thank you, Father. Amen. And now it's on. There we go. Fantastic. I won't need it that loud. I don't think. No. If, if I do, if you keep it this loud, who's, who's in charge of that? There we go. Charles there. If you keep it this loud, I'll just have to whisper my way through the sermon, and that'll be boring, I think. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Quite exciting that we are working through a book together. That means... It's not just the random thoughts of leaders, good or not so good that they might be. It's actually we're rooted into the Bible itself, and that's a huge blessing. It is uh, sometimes quite surprising that uh, churches don't always necessarily preach through the Bible, but obviously I think for us it's, uh, this is the authority, this is where we get our our guide for what we believe and how we live, our lifestyle choices and our kind of convictions around what is true is rooted in the Bible itself, not in charismatic leader or not in kind of trends or traditions, but in the Bible itself. That gives us great hope and strength. So it, we're in Ephesians chapter 5, just at the beginning, the first 14 verses, um, I can't remember which translation this is, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. Verse 1, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But sexual immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be mentioned among you as is proper among saints. He calls you children, he calls you saints. And there must be no filthiness or foolish talk or vulgar joking which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no sexually immoral or impure or greedy person which amounts to an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. See that no one deceives you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become partners with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. 
as you try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the useless deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them, for it's disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Isn't that amazing? passage of scripture. Incredible. Now there's way too much in there for a single sermon, so I've had to kind of draw some principles through. And so I just have three points and an exhortation. One, two, three, and an exhortation, and then hopefully our lives will be radically changed forever, because that's what we're trying to do here. So first of all, the first point is this. As much loved children, as beloved children imitate God. Imitate God. Now, I know this sounds cheesy, but as a parent, and as Ali said, we had four of, uh, we still have them, but we had four of our own um, still in existence. And um, the, one, of the, one of the lovely things is <laughs> when they get to the age where they start copying you in worship, you know, if you're raised in the church, you'll know this. And if your kids have been raised in the church, you'll know it's a kind of a wonderful, sweet thing that they imitate worship. And you, you don't know, is it really worship? Like, that's not the point. They're, they're copying you, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Um, or or <coughs> when uh, we had three daughters, and we still have three daughters and a son. I'm talking about them in the past tense. I'm not quite sure why. Anyway, I'm thinking of when they were little. You know, when your daughters begin to imitate mum and put lipstick and, you know, makeup all over their foreheads and everything. Um, you know, it's kind of a, it's a sweet thing to see that imitation. This, uh, this is a lovely uh, illustration of that very thing. That this, it's a gorgeous picture. You can leave it there for a while if you like. Paul says, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. And unfortunately, you know the chapter divisions and the verse numbers are not part of the original text of the of the scriptures, neither in the Hebrew Bible nor in the New Testament. And this is one of those moments where the chapter division is a little bit abrupt. Now, you looked at it last week, but Paul is continuing an argument. He's been urging believers to live, and I've woken up the baby already, sorry, love. He's urging the believers to live in a new way, and he uses this image of walking, as we saw last time, to describe how you live. You used to live in a certain way, but now you are to live and walk in a different way. So chapter 4, verse 17 and 18, walk no longer as the Gentiles do in the hardness of their heart. Verse 22, put off the old self, 24, put on the new self. There's a putting off and there's a, a putting on. And he gives instruction in, in chapter 4 about in terms of honesty, anger, generosity, speech, and he ends by saying, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. And now the therefore comes in. It's part of the same logical sequence in his mind. Imitate God. You're putting off and you're putting on. Copy God. And as Christians, we need to walk in love. We need to apply our new life in Christ to our minds, to our motives, and to our behavior in all things because we are children of God. Not because we are trying to become children of God, but because we already are. If you're born again, you're born again into the kingdom of God. You're born again into a family. God is your father. Whatever your behavior has been like, you're to pray, our father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. That will never change. Once you're born again, you can't be unborn again. Again, It's not possible. He's your father now. So what's reality? God is now my father, and I am now a child of God. And Paul says, therefore, imitate God. Now, we live in a, a kind of historic moment when authenticity is being prized in a way I think is not too bad, but is often subjective. 
I mean, Ali did it beautifully, didn't he? We, we, we want authenticity. And in the, well, I'll come to this. Let me first of all talk about, people talk about their truth. That, but that's my truth rather than the truth. In other words, they want to be true to themselves. They don't want, just want it imposed upon them. There's something that's good about that. It's not just all wrong. People want reality. They want what is actually true in their lives. We long for the real thing, not for the fake thing. And unfortunately, church and religion, we sang even a song about it you know, as so often about outward appearance rather than inward reality, the form of religion without the power of a changed life internally. And people do pay a lot of money. You think of leather handbags. People pay a lot of money for an authentic leather handbag, not one of the knockoffs. Or you remember they, they, they invented this fake or imitation leather and so it's not real leather. They gave it a French name to make it sound a little bit kind of posh, classy, and fashionable. It's called faux leather, F-A-U-X. You must have heard of that. Faux leather. It's like, hmm, yes, this is faux leather. So it is leather. It's just faux leather. No, it's not leather. It's imitation leather. And people want the real thing. And there's something that's good about that. But not all imitation is fakery. Not all imitation is automatically wrong. When you learn to do something, you normally learn from someone who already knows how to do it. This is the principle of apprenticeship or even discipleship. You actually see someone doing something well and then you imitate them. And that's not wrong. So during lockdown, I don't know how many of you did this. I was an outstanding failure in this, uh, in this regard. I looked up how to make sourdough bread like an idiot. I looked up how to make sourdough bread. bread. Everyone, was, everyone was doing this. I had my little jar of festering whatever it was that you'd cream it off and replace it and stuff. And in the end, after about a month or two months, still nothing was happening. But I looked it up on YouTube and a video that had just come out had nine and a half million views already. So the principle there is you, you watch how it's done and then you imitate it. That's not always a bad thing. So there's a difference between being authentic and actually learning how to do something. So apprenticeship, whether it's a watchmaker or a sculptor or an interior designer or whatever it is in the arts, or you know, you learn from someone else. That's not a bad thing. And Paul tells us, imitate God. Put something off. Put, it's not putting it on. It's not fake. When you're trying to live for God in a godly way. It's imitation that can lead to transformation in your life. And you mustn't say this, oh, you know, walking in love, being tender-hearted. That's just not who I am. That's not the real, no, 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 that's a mistake. Remember, you're putting off the old and putting on the new. What's true of you? That's not who I am, that kind of, no, I just say, like, what's true of you? You're a child of God. That's what's true of you. So what's your starting point? You start by saying, as beloved children, imitate God. I am a child of God. That is who I am, and I'm a much-loved child of God. Don't look in the mirror and say, you're amazing, because you're not. <laughs> you know, the mirror, mirror, mirror on the wall, shush, you're not amazing. You know, it's, it's actually, look in the mirror, I am a child of God. That's who I am. I'm actually a child, a much-loved, cherished, highly prized child of God. Christ died for you. Gave everything, we'll get onto that, for you to bring you into that relationship with God. So who am I? I'm a child of God. It's wonderful. Therefore, imitate your Father in heaven. It's a simple point, really. That's what Paul's saying. We're to put on compassion and so on and so forth because we are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. We are becoming like 
our Father in heaven who is compassionate. So putting it on isn't faking it. To be an authentic Christian and to move away from sinful patterns of the past, whatever those sinful patterns may be, whether it's outbursts of anger or racist attitudes or greed, which Paul mentions here, or unforgiveness or whatever it is, Paul says, put it off and put it on. Be imitators of God. Now, sometimes it can be difficult to change a pattern of behavior. I had a friend of mine who, in the, on the south coast of England, where Joe and I kind of lived for most of our lives, um, before South Africa, um, a friend of mine uh, went to spend some time with a farmer who was in the, in the church. And uh, the farmer said, do you want to go on the tractor going around there? You know, and he said, yeah, great, why not? I've never driven a tractor before. Who's driven a tractor? You may have driven a tractor, but I haven't driven a tractor. Anyway, so he gets in, and he goes round and round and round, and, and so he says, now let's go out and back off onto the road. And he tried to turn the handle, but the grooves of that, that had been made by the, 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 the wheels going around a gazillion times in the past had actually created these, these inter indentations, grooves, so that when he twisted it, it just sprang back on him. He said, it nearly broke my wrist. It can be difficult to slow down and intentionally break out of a pattern of behavior that kind of has become part of your life. But that's what Paul is exhorting you to do. That's what God through the scriptures is exhorting you to do today to say I, i'm going to change i'm going to become not a different i'm going to become who i already am in christ a child of god and i'm going to imitate the i'm going to have upon me the likeness of my father in heaven who is holy and who is pure so you need to ask yourself what am I imitating? Who am I actually imitating in my, in my life? What is influencing me? Because our desire to imitate God isn't bogus. It's actually true. Your, your desire to want to see the sick healed, your desire to want to, I don't know, prophesy, your desire to want to preach the gospel so that hundreds of non-believers will be cut to the heart and repent of their sin and turn to Christ and the Holy Spirit being put in your, your, your desire to build something beautiful for God amongst the poor. What, whatever your, your ambition in God is, you can come to him and say, God, help me to do this. Help me to do this. So this isn't an, an, amb an ambition killer. This enables you to take on more and more responsibility in God without jeopardizing the work because the character work is being done in you. Imitate God as beloved children. And even when you're under pressure, so I know, I know for me, as, as we began praying for the sick and people began to get healed, I remember people, <laughs> some people said, well, who do you think you are? It's true. No one really except a child of God, born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, commissioned and sent to go into all the world, preach the gospel, and these signs will follow you. Apart from that, not much really. And, and the thing is, people can, you might be in a situation today, this might be a word for you, where your motives are being questioned, where you maybe have enemies and you thought, well, I didn't expect to have enemies. You're a child of God. Come back to the fact that who you really are, God sees you as you really are. So no matter what someone else is saying about you, no matter what the devil is lying to you and accusing you, no matter what your own mind is even, you know, Paul says, I, I, you know, I, I don't know about my heart, but I'm trusting God. He knows my heart. You're a child of God. Let it settle in your life so that you can have peace and move forward. Copy Jesus. Don't copy the nonsense of those who are against you. You don't have to respond to everything. You can trust in God because in Christ, you're a new creation. 
The old has gone. You might just have become a Christian on this last alpha, and you've already had an argument with someone where you didn't behave brilliantly or you overstepped, you crossed the line, and they said to you, Aha! I knew you hadn't changed. You're still the same. And you have to go back to God and say, All right, I'm learning how to follow you. I'm learning how to walk in a new way. But it, it, the starting point isn't my behavior. The starting point is I am a new creation in Christ. The old has gone and the new has come. The truth is you are a child of God, chosen by him, loved by him, belonging to him. He's responsible for you. Now, that's what it means when you say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You're saying, he's responsible for me. I'm no longer responsible for straightening everything out and all the rest of it. He's responsible for me. He's your shepherd. Therefore, peace. You can lie down beside a flowing stream while the world is kind of going crazy all around you. He prepares a table for you in the presence of your enemies. He anoints your head with oil. Your cup overflows because you're a child of God. In love, Paul says in Ephesians 1 verse 5, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. You're a child of God. And John writes a bit later in 1 John 3, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed, that is, permanently fixed upon us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. So that's the first point, imitate God. Secondly, walk in the light. Walk in the light. Now you are light in the Lord, verse 7. Now that you are light in the Lord, walk as children of light. So there should be a contrast between how Christians behave and how those without Christ behave. It should be, there should be light. And the contrast in the, in the whole book of Ephesians is obviously a contrast with the behavior of those around them, behavior that was perfectly normal, that wasn't even questioned in Ephesus. And Paul is saying, but you, you're to live a different way. He's exhorting them to live differently from the Ephesians round about them. So, for example, not immorality, not impurity, not greed, verses 3 and 5, not filthiness, not vulgarity, verse 4, not foolishness, and not being influenced by deceptive, empty words. That's pretty much the whole of that section that we looked at. Now, I think we are clear, aren't we, that the, Christian, the traditional Christian view on sexual immorality, no sex before marriage, um, uh, you no know, pornography, um, and, and marriage between a man and a woman for the whole of life, no adultery, that's kind of standard Christian morality. That hasn't changed. The Scriptures haven't changed on all of that. For Christians seeking to follow Christian principles, that's not an unusual or outrageous thing. But how did greed get in there? Did you notice that? How, what? Greed. Listen to verse 5 again. For this you know with certainty, that no sexually immoral or impure or greedy person, which amounts to an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So these things are forms of idolatry. And when you give yourself to them, you are essentially kind of ignoring the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit over there, and you are, you are sacrificing to an idol, whether it's sexual impurity or whether it's greed even. It's an amazing thing. John Chrysostom was a fourth-century preacher, actually from Antioch originally, and then he moved to the great Christian city of Constantinople, Byzantium, which is now, uh, after the Muslim invasions and so on, conquests, is now Istanbul. His preaching, and, uh, and the Hagia Sophia was built on the, on the ground of, of his church, 
uh, or the, ch the structure that he preached in. His preaching was so popular that, what is it? 1,800, 1900 years later. I mean, it's 1,600 years later. 800 of his sermons still exist. It's an incredible thing. From so long ago, you can still read the sermons of Chrysostom. He was called Golden Mouths, which is what Chrysostom means. His preaching was absolutely uncompromising, and he had no qualms about exposing society's sins. And it did get him into trouble, like it gets all preachers into trouble. He says this, It is foolishness and a public madness, i.e. it's socially irresponsible, to fill your cupboards with clothing and to allow men who are created in God's image and likeness to stand naked and trembling with the cold so that they can hardly hold themselves upright. You are large and fat. We don't hear preaching like that these days. <laughs> you are large and fat and hold drinking parties until late at night and sleep in a warm, soft bed. And do you not think of how you must give an account of your misuse of the gifts of God? Wow. <coughs> so we, we're clear on you know, sexual ethics as Christians, generally, aren't we? Or we should be. But when it comes to material greed, that kind of somehow, and the whole prosperity teaching, that's, that somehow kind of got through this filter. Paul says we're to walk in the light. We're to do good. He talks about goodness and righteousness and truth. You were once darkness. Now you are light in the Lord. Therefore, do not participate in the useless deeds of darkness. Now, in each of our lives, those are different things. But, for, you know, just think about it for a second. What, what are the deeds of darkness that I'm sometimes drawn to? towards. Paul says they are useless, useless, unfruitful deeds of darkness. So let there be a clear contrast in your life, between your life and the lives of those around you. Don't just say, well, it's acceptable now. <coughs> no, there should be a contrast. Ephesus was a raging, non-believing, pagan city where 101 different practices, way worse than we're seeing now, I expect. And Paul still preaches this very, very clear line for us. This is how you should live. Because you are children of God. Not because we're trying to go back to the 1950s. You know, it's not, not because we're trying to, ah, we don't like people doing what they want in the privacy of their own home. No, that's not where Paul's coming from. He's saying to you, he's not preaching to the world here. He's preaching to the church, and he's saying, this is for you. If you call yourself a Christian, it affects your lifestyle choices. He's not addressing the non-Christian. The, 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 the message to the non-Christian is Jesus Christ is the Son of God, was born, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for your sins, was raised from the dead, and is alive now and calling you to repent and believe in him. That's the, that's the word to the world. The world to the Christian community is, therefore, since that you've the Holy Spirit has applied that into your life and you've trusted in Him, now you live in a different way as children of much loved by God, walk in the light. And then thirdly, I want to go back up to verse 2 and just look at briefly, I've kind of touched on it just there, the reason for this voluntary change of lifestyle on your part and that is that Jesus loved you and gave himself up for you. Why? Why this change? Why? What, what's the reason for it? What's the, what's the power? Where's the drive coming from for this change in my lifestyle? Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Interesting. A fragrant aroma. On one of our alphas, uh, we were, when during lockdown, we did it online as well. Um, 
We had people from the UK and we had someone from China uh, involved as a South African living and working in China. It was great in terms of doing it all on Zoom because you could actually, it was international, it didn't matter where you lived. I mean, for the person living in China, it mattered because you had to get up at three in the morning. But, you know, it was, and actually our life group, which has been formed out of that alpha, so Joe and my life group was formed out of that alpha, and we still have a couple of folk who haven't yet put their trust in Christ, who, and we still have two people who are in the UK as well. It's just bizarre, it's great. Um, anyway, one of our group members was uh, caught COVID early on, and it hit her massively. It was terrible. And she was hospitalized several times, and it was, um, you know, very serious. And it was during that period of time, we had it as well, where no one was allowed to visit in the hospital either. So she's in hospital in the UK somewhere, I don't know where, and um, her husband couldn't go and visit her. So he had two, he, they had two ways of kind of maintaining a connection. He, uh, he has a Harley Davidson, so he would roar outside where he, he knew that she was. So he'd roar up and down, up and down, and she would, she would be able to hear that and know he's, he's just there, which is lovely. I don't have a spiritual parallel for that one. And, uh, <laughs> but the other thing that they did is he somehow got to her um, either a T-shirt or, Joe, was it like a bottle of his aftershave or something like that? So something that had his aftershave on it. And she, it, she just, so the combination of the roaring bike and this fragrance that was his typical fragrance just gave her such a sense of, you know, I'm loved. You know, he can't get in to actually see me. Where there's, a, there's a temporary separation, but it communicated so much. The reason we did that is because one, one of the life group, we, we, we don't always do icebreakers, but we did an icebreaker, which was find something quirky or weird or unusual in your house that needs an explanation. And, and, and bring, if you can bring it, you know, what is this? <laughs> I thought it was kind of good, a good one. And so hers was this, this fragrant T-shirt or bottle of, I can't remember which, which it was. And it was just a wonderful moment. Mine was half a brick from District 6, which I've got, I've got one half of the brick is in my, is in my study <laughs> in Clough Street. And the other half is just at home, like where you would have like some kind of statue or some, something nice or something. That, it's just a brick there. And I'm going to keep it there until people who's, who were forcibly removed from District 6 get their homes back. And then I can, I'll try and find some kind of nice little, you know, family photograph or something to put there. But at the moment, it's, a br it's just half a brick. And it's people like, what on earth is that? Well, it's, a, it's, the, it's the legacy of the past is what it is. And it's still unresolved. Anyway, so... so that was, that was a beautiful story. And, and, and this verse tells us that Christ's sacrifice on the cross was like a pleasing aroma to God the Father. It was like a, a fragrant offering. And, you know, in one sense, the ultimate intervention of God into our brokenness and into our broken human history is on the cross. It's where Jesus gave everything for the Father and for you. Willingly, not unwillingly, willingly, he went to the cross to take the punishment for your sin and my sin and your shame and my shame. And in that moment, he stepped in front of us, as it were, and received into himself the full weight of God's inflexibly righteous hostility and anger against sin. It, it came upon Christ, the anger, the fury of God, the judgment of the wrath of God, the judgment of God against sin, which we do not realize is as serious as it actually is, was placed upon Christ. 
It's like a ball of fire coming towards us, and Jesus steps in front of us and receives it into his own being. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ stepped into your place and my place and took the punishment that we deserve for stuff that we've done, for our stupidity and our selfishness, greed, impurity, sexual, all the things that are mentioned there, sexual immorality, everything. Jesus took it all as though it was his, and it wasn't his. He was like a lamb, pure, perfect, sacrificed before God so that you and I could come into this relationship and live in a new way for his glory, for his glory and that we would be enlisted into his mission to preach the good news, to reconcile the world to himself through Christ. That's God's plan. To all who received him, says John, to those who believed in his name, he became the right to become children of God. And even again, even though it's, it sounds a little bit like a cliche, but the light comes. We were in darkness, and the light came in Christ and still shines in the darkness, and the darkness can't overthrow it or overcome it or even comprehend it. The light, present tense, shines in the darkness. And part of what we're doing here is not just adjusting our own behavior to try and be as good as we can. There's a world to reach. There's a message to preach. There are multitudes that we know nothing about that are going to be swept into the kingdom of God. God is going to pour out His Spirit in such a way that will astonish us all and bring multitudes into the kingdom of God, that they also might experience the love of God, that they also might become much-loved children of God. Listen to C.S. Lewis. He understood conversion, and he wrote this in a book that I doubt any of you has read. It would be interesting if you have. English literature in the 16th century, excluding drama. Oh. <laughs> They knew how to do titles then, didn't they? It's actually part of a set on English literature, and that was his academic expertise, was in Renaissance and um, uh, 16th century Elizabethan literature. Anyway, um, not Renaissance. So he says this, in the mind of a Tyndale or Luther, as in the mind of St. Paul himself, this theology, what I've just been preaching to you now, was by no means an intellectual construction. It springs directly out of a highly specialized religious experience, that of catastrophic conversion. The man who has passed through it feels like one who has waked from a nightmare into ecstasy. Like an accepted lover, he feels that he has done nothing and never could have done anything to deserve such astonishing happiness. All the initiative has been on God's side. All has been free, unbounded grace, and all will continue to be free, unbounded grace. Isn't that great? Absolutely wonderful. Imitate God. Walk in the light because Christ himself gave himself for you, and then finally the exhortation at the end. Awake, O oh sleeper, <laughs> you sleepy, sleepy head. Wake up! You know, it's like, uh, well, this isn't a relevant one, but Bob Dylan's song, When You're Gonna Wake Up on Slow Train Coming. Uh, I think our guitarist friend who has little shades of Mark Knopfler in his style on, the, on his, the, his, his Stratocaster, uh, you know, Mark Knopfler, that was the first time we heard of Mark Knopfler is when he played on Bob Dylan's album, Slow Train Coming, before Dire Straits. And fantastic guitar. Anyway, one of the songs is, When Are You Gonna Wake Up? I remember as a non-Christian, when I lived for a month at, at the uh, foot of the Himalayas, as, as you do. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, there, there was just no music except a cassette tape. You can ask your parents about what that is. Um, uh, of Slow Train Coming by Bob Dylan. And so he like drummed into us every single day. You know, I'm a non-Christian. It's like, when are you going to wake up? When are you going to wake up? And I'm thinking, yeah, when are you going to wake up? When are you going to wake up? When are you going to wake up? You know, the Christians around you, they're nice people, and it's all lovely, and they're good people, and they, 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 you know, they go quiet when it gets to some of the more tricky questions, and they kind of clear on some of the others. 
Wake up, O sleeper, and rise from the dead. And Christ, I mean, how, what a privilege. Christ will shine on you. John Calvin, writing around 1550, just so another kind of modern voice for us, said, this is the ordinary message which is every day delivered by preachers of the gospel. It's time to wake up. It's time to realize, hey, I'm not my own. I'm a child of God. I need to follow him. Start living for Jesus. Put off immorality. Put off all the nonsense. Live a new life for Jesus Christ. And Christ will shine on you. Like Lewis said, <coughs> it's conversion, genuine being born again is like waking up. It is like from a weird dream. Keith Green used to say that. Waking up from the strangest dream. You, you, you kind of, and then you come into a new reality. This is a new way of living. And you don't carry your old beliefs through. I mean, my, I was converted when I was 20. My thing was, okay, if this is real, if this is true, I, I'm, I'm basically a baby. You know, philosophically, ideologically, yeah, I wasn't a baby intellectually, and I'd read widely by then, of course, but you know, I need to now learn how to do life from scratch. I'm not actually carrying over my prejudices from before, whether it be about sexual ethics or whether it be about you know, the issue of abortion or whatever the issues are, how I should live money, all the rest of it, what I should do with my... I'm not carrying them over into this new thing, I'm saying, okay, I need to learn from scratch. I don't want to mess this up. I want it to be real. I want, and I want to be a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to take what the Scriptures say, and I'm going to follow it. I'm going to learn from preachers and pastors and friends and mature mothers and fathers in the life of the church, but the authority is the Bible. Help me, Lord, to understand it. And then I just dived in. You know, you're not going to be perfect, but you're, you're on a new course. You're living like a child of God. You've woken up from the nightmare. Light has come at last. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If you continue in my word, you will be my disciple, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That phrase is not to be taken out of context just to be attached to anything. If you continue in my word, says Jesus, then you will be my disciple. You will start following me and then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And if you're a believer that's been digging into the darkness, it's time to step back into the light. It's time to say enough. And if you're not yet a believer, it's time to say, hey, help me, I want to believe. Thomas said, you know, I, how, how are we supposed to know the way to life? How do we know that? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. I mean, this is for all of us, isn't it? I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It'd be lying if he said, there are many paths. Because there are many paths but they all go to different destinations like paths do. Different paths go to different places. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He'd be lying if he said otherwise. Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead. Christ will shine on you. Amen? So, imitate God because you genuinely are a precious, much-loved child of God. Therefore, because of what Christ has done for you, walk in the light and spread that light around the world. Amen? We're going to break bread together, and I'm guessing at what your normal tradition is, so I pray, and then just, do, do people go to the thing and just, do, do they hold it, or do they eat it around there? Or? Okay. So I'll tell you what, is this the only one? No, there are two. So let me pray. And there's one, at, there's one at the back over on uh, that way. Let, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to go to the tables. Maybe don't drink it there. Come back to your seat with a table and the cracker, and, and then we'll break bread together as one body. Is that okay? 
Father, we thank you so much for your, your word to us. Uh, Lord, <laughs> you know our hearts, you know our lives, and we say to you, God, we do want to live in an authentically imitative way of you. We want to live out who we really are in the core of our being. We don't want this disconnect between who we know we are and the kind of fractured life that we sometimes live. So we pray, Lord, that you would take this word, these 14 verses, speak them into our hearts. Help us to find grace for forgiveness of ourselves, of others, and help us, Lord, to follow after you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.